Hey guys, it's Matt Haycox here, and today we are making a special edition of what I'm calling my Compendium of Corona. Now, as you know, when I interview my guests, for me it's really important to kind of extract tangible, actionable information from them that you guys can go home and, and implement to make an immediate difference in your business or in your life. And I think right now there's nothing more relevant to all of us than Corona uh, and the impact it is going to have on us as a nation, on our businesses and us as indi individuals and our families. But also as is always the case in these kind of you know pandemic situations, there is oodles and oodles of misinformation and hysteria out there. So what I wanted to do is go away and get three experts for you, um, who are you know absolute experts in their respective fields that all relate to Corona, uh, and we're going to interview them. Uh, Today is also the first time we're doing a podcast on a kind of a, a group Skype session because these guys are all around the world, um, and we're going to try and extract all the information that we need to know about corona from the perspective of both the virus itself from its impact on businesses and how businesses can react to it and also from its impact on society and the kind of uh, development and prevention and, and dealing with the hysteria element of it so i've got three different guests with us today i've got rob lampkin williams Rob is a decorated scientist who in 2001 conducted the first human viral challenge clinical trial, uh, which is the first to be conducted in Europe in the 21st century. These became known as flu camp. Um, he is an expert on multiple respiratory viruses, including common colds, coronaviruses, SARS, RSV and flu. Uh, and essentially, therefore, one of the most uh, foremost minds on immunology in Britain today. Uh, we've got Andy Clayton. Andy studied science at Oxford, but he's now a successful entrepreneur. But more personally, he's lived in China for the last 15 years, and therefore he knows exactly what's been happening over there, how society and businesses have reacted to it, and therefore how we can uh, consider that and make use of it in the UK. And we've also got Laura Spinney. Now, Laura is a science journalist. She's a novelist, novelist and an author. And her latest book is called Pale Rider, The Spanish Flu of 1918 and How It Changed the World. Uh, so Laura is joining us today from Paris, where she's reporting on the ongoing situation for The Guardian, amongst other news outlets. So you've got three very different but very expert people to cover what I hope is every angle of corona that we need to know. This whole piece should end up being about half an hour long. And I'd like to think at the end of it, you have got all you need to know without having any uh, any hysteria, any bullshit, uh, and, and, and anything that is gonna take us away from the facts. So um, I hope you enjoy. Well, listen, I guess the, for me, the best place to start here is right at the very beginning. And can you tell us what actually coronavirus is and where it came from and how we've kind of gotten to where we are today? Coronavirus is actually a common cold. It's a virus you've caught many, many times in your life. Um, you've caught a very simple version of it. Um, and and it, it's something a lot of people will catch every winter. It'll be a mild cold. It'll give you a sore throat, croaky voice. Um, you know, you might even have a mild cough. It's generally just quite a mild cold, a common cold. Every now and then, like any virus of its type, um, it mutates. And we first saw the biggest example of that with SARS, um, which was quite some time ago now. Uh, then there was another outbreak of a very big mutation of that virus called MERS, which was Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome virus. Um, that happened in the Middle East, as the name suggests. And now this is the third time we've seen a very big change in that virus. And all of a sudden it will do a mutation that mutation means that our bodies have never seen it before. So we've got no pre-existing immunity to it. So for lots and lots of people, it will be nothing more than a mild cold, an irritating cold, maybe what a lot of people might consider a bit of like flu. But unfortunately for a substantial number of people, it can actually be very dangerous and quite serious. And, and in particular people. 
just just, hold, just holding that thought for a second, Rob. Just going back to where where, where it's come from in terms of how, how has it now infiltrated its way into into our society? You know, when 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 was the first case of this new corona um, uh, um, identified, and why has it happened? Basically, viruses can um, do something which is. If you have a virus that's amongst humans, take smallpox as an example, and don't don't misunderstand me. I'm not comparing this to the disaster that was smallpox and that. We were able to eradicate smallpox from the planet because it only existed in human beings. Coronaviruses exist in animals and human beings. So you've got a mixture. And what happens is when human beings live close to their animals, but live animals, um, in in um, slaughterhouses in and in particular in Wuhan in China where they live very close to their animals, um, that's where a new virus can mutate very rapidly to cross over and into a human being. It's um, it's called a xenotrope virus, and so it literally means it jumps from an animal to a human being, and is able to do that. So that's what's happened here. We've had, seen a virus that was a coronavirus, a coronavirus which a coronavirus, we, as human beings, we have our own coronaviruses. Animals have their own coronaviruses. In this case, one of those has transferred to us. Okay. Now, how, how likely are we to catch it? Um, overall, in the long run, probably most people will, at some point, catch it. Um, it's, it's, it's a virus, it will transmit. We catch viruses all the time and barely know them. Uh, but we, we hardly even notice it. So, but it doesn't mean you're going to every single person is going to end up in hospital. It it means that a very few people are going to get very sick, very uh, yeah, very sick, very sick, and end up in hospital. But some people might have like mild flu. Other people might have just like a normal cold. And then there will be a group of people who catch it, but don't actually even notice they've got it. But even those people, those people who don't even notice they've got it, and those people who have got the mild version, if they transfer it to somebody who's at risk, who you know is elderly, who could end up in hospital, that's where the risk comes in. And it is spreading fast because it is actually a very contagious virus. Uh, now, what precautions can we and should we be taking? Right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be very very boring and say what everybody's been saying. Wash your hands. <laughs> Wash your hands. Absolutely. I mean, basically, there should be. I, 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 I've actually said it for a long time, but when you go to work, the first first thing you should do when you go to work, go to the washroom and wash your hands. You've just been on public transport. You've just been outside. Go and wash your hands. Do the happy birthday song, 20 seconds. Wash your hands properly. Don't just rinse them under water. Use soap. Sing happy birthday. I think there are a few other songs you can do Toto by Africa if you want to. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. I guess it depends but, how clean you want to be, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, right. But Toto by Africa is actually about 20 seconds long. But wash your hands 20 seconds. Ideally, use paper towels to dry your hands and not hair, hand sanitizers. People think they are better. They're not. Paper towels are better at drying your hands. So when you get to work, do that. Um, when you're at work, if you've got the opportunity, wash your hands as often as you can. Always carry a hand sanitizer around with you. And just to prove the point, if you can see it, I've got one myself right here. Um, you know, that have that on you. Go on public transport. Use that, you know, Keep your hands as clean as possible. And, and actually, very, very importantly, when you get home, wash your hands again and thoroughly because you're now taking it back to your parents and your loved ones and, in, and quite particularly your grandparents who might actually be at risk. So that's a big classic one. 
wash your hands is the best thing you can do at the moment. Now, from my layman's perspective of, of let's say, um, of the uh, Spanish flu, you know, it, it wasn't, there wasn't anything like, obviously, the hysteria and the talk, etc., around it, because, because obviously we, we didn't have back then, you know, social media, communication channels, etc. Et I mean, how, how different would things have been for them? You know, should should they have had social media? Should should they have had you know, media yeah. outlets? Would it have been worse, or would it have been more contained? Uh, it's a really good question, Matt. I mean, obviously, the world was was very different in many different ways then. Um, also, the germ was different. The disease was different. So there's lots of things that that were different. But the informational aspect, I think, is fascinating because. Uh, so mainly, you got your news though in those days through newspapers. Um, obviously, uh, there was no internet, but there was no radio or TV either, really, um, on a, on a grand scale. Um, and so, uh, it was much slower. News was much slower. And then of course it overlapped at least to begin with, with the war. And in the, and during the war, at least in the belligerent nations, there was censorship, massive censorship. In fact, that's the reason that it's called the Spanish flu, even though it didn't start in Spain. And I can explain that if you're interested, it, it'll take me a minute. But, um... Our problem is different. We have vast amounts of information and vast amounts of misinformation, all traveling at the speed of light. Um, and I think this is one of our big problems. It, it's against a backdrop of even the experts, you, you, you alluded to it yourself a little bit earlier, even the experts don't really know what they're talking about when it comes to this coronavirus yet. We're all, we're all sort of groping for data to understand it. Um, and uh, obviously there are many people who are much more expert than me, doctors and uh, epidemiologists and microbiologists and virologists and so on. But even they are dealing with a brand new pathogen. So we're waiting to understand what, how this virus behaves. And in the meantime, people are talking, talking, talking. I'm as guilty as the next person. Um, and some people are speaking with more authority than others. But I, I, you know, I, I sometimes wonder, actually, if there shouldn't be just one website, one channel of information, at least per country, maybe the Ministry of Health, which is putting out one clear message and updating it all the time rather than, you know, what's actually happening. Now, Andy, China's ahead of us all uh, in, in terms of the impact of the virus. I mean, how, how have Chinese businesses been impacted by it? And, and what have they been doing that we can kind of take a lead from? So you can see Chinese businesses similar to over here. They Some people have benefited from it. For certain businesses, it's been a, a windfall. Um, so most businesses have been heavily, heavily disrupted. And then for some businesses, it's been seriously if not critically harmful so that's kind of the spread and and, and what 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 have the government been doing over there that are, are things that we're going to see here i mean i guess you know china presumably was the first place first place with lockdown with self isolation etc i mean how how has the impact of that been you know uh, i mean i guess it, you know it's all very well saying look th these are the precautions that we need to take but in china they're ahead of the curve enough to have also seen you know what adverse impact uh, have these precautions have had even though they've probably had no choice but to take them uh, but you know what, what, what is happening over there so china have been much more forceful in their quarantine measures so my family members that are over there still to this day they're allowed out once every two to three days for two hours in order to buy food and that's it all the rest of the time they are forced to stay at home or in their compound so there's still significant parts of china that are on that kind of that level of lockdown how long ago now, did what china start? have done is how long ago well, that's been for a month, month and a half, so mid mid January, so almost two months now. Now, what China have done, which is quite interesting, and, and I think everyone will start to get familiar with this concept over here, is they've identified three levels of lockdown. So the first level is just educational. So it's telling people, be aware, wash your hands, uh, distance yourself, stay at home if you have to. Then the second level is they restrict public gatherings. They um, close down schools, um, and um, but they allow workplaces to carry on. They, they keep public transport open. And then level three is this full lockdown where everybody is forced to stay at home and anything that isn't you know, selling food or a hospital or a police station or something like that is, is on enforced lockdown. And so what they've done is they've categorized each city and region of the city 
a region of the country, sorry, by level one, level two, level three. And then as case levels change, they move the cities between these these levels of, um, of lockdown. The other part of your question is kind of what are they doing for businesses? Um, so, for example, they have deferred all um, essentially like national insurance, social insurance contributions for six months. And that's to date is a deferral. They've um, written off a lot of taxes similar to over here. Um, they've had to inject, obviously, a lot of liquidity into the market and they have a high degree of control over their banking system. So they're able to roll over loans and mortgages and those sorts of things. Um, but And those are measures that we will see and are starting to see over here too. Now, Laura, what do you think the next steps that you know society should take you know, when facing something of this potential magnitude? Uh, I mean, we're taking steps on various different levels. We have our governments, which are trying to do their best to manage the crisis in the population. We've got our scientists who are working on vaccines and new antiviral drugs and so on. Um, I, I think in, uh, I mean, in terms of reducing the impact of this pandemic, it's going to take the entire population to pull their weight in different ways. So, for example, the other day I was talking to um, uh, somebody in the Ministry of Health in uh, Singapore, which is often being held up these days as a model of how how best to you know manage this disease. And he was saying, we are really putting the emphasis in our messaging in on individual responsibility, on the social pact. If you feel ill, you must self-isolate, stay at home, don't go to work, don't put others in danger. And then we're asking employers to be flexible about their employees' uh, homeworking. We're asking doctors to be liberal with medical leave um, uh, up to five days in their case. And of course, the government was trying to, they, they were trying to, orchestrate a cross-government response so that all the departments were working together, singing from the same hymn sheet, very important, so that the population can see that the government is united, have trust in them, and therefore is more likely to comply with anything they are asked to do. But um, yeah, everybody needs to pull their weight. That That's what it's going to take next, especially since, and since we don't have a vaccine available for 12 to 18 months, and the vaccine is the only thing that is going to stop people getting sick. We can slow the pandemic without a vaccine, but that's the only thing that will stop people getting sick. Rob, I want to talk to you about uh, vaccinations and cures. Um, okay. are, are there either, and how quickly can we expect one of one of either? Okay, well, uh, uh, trials of a vaccine started either today or yesterday. Um, I have to explain. I was actually on a plane scheduled to go to Tenerife. Yes, uh, sorry, to Gran Canaria yesterday and spent five hours on the tarmac before they actually got us off the plane and we ended up staying in the UK. So I was caught up in this yesterday. Um, so so whether it was yesterday or today, they actually started the tests of the first vaccine. But that's just the safety testing. You have to make sure that vaccine is safe and it's not going to hurt people more than it how it helps them. And so that's the first bit. So this, could, this could, that could be months. That could be months away. That that will that will be months away. To, well, it will be months to actually make sure it's safe, to actually be sure that we can give it to enough people to be it safe. Then you have to actually check whether it actually works, because if you actually mass produce a vaccine, and in you know millions of doses, give it to everybody, and then discover there was an issue with safety because the safety study would only have a few thousand in it, then, then you've got a big problem. So you need a way of testing it to make sure it works. So there have been various people have quoted between 12 to 18 months. My own opinion is that, and that's from experience of, I've helped develop several vaccines and my own opinion, and, it, and time is, and it is getting quicker, but I would say we're probably about two to two and a half years away on a vaccine, um, that would be what I would expect. As far as drugs to actually treat um, the virus, there are drug, the antiviral drugs tend to be very, very specific. A, a antiviral drug for flu won't work for hepatitis B, for example, but there are some drugs that do cross over and some of those drugs are being tested. So it is possible there is already an antiviral drug that may be possible, may at least help in the most severe cases. Um, but those are being tested and those 
at best will take a year to properly be tested, I would assume. So, so, so I guess as, as promising as that is for the future, the important takeaway for now is neither the vaccine nor the cure is going to be of any use to any of us right now because it's not going to exist. No, it, it doesn't exist. You, know, it, 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 you phrased it perfectly. It won't be of any use to us at the moment right now because it doesn't exist. That's it. Um, and it will take time to develop both. Andy, have you seen any businesses actually be able to adapt to the situation yet, or is it still still too early to uh, still too early to tell? And on what kind of and, and if the answer to any of that is yes, what kind of adaptations can UK businesses take from this? Right, and that's that's the most interesting thing. And so, if you take that spectrum, right, you've got people that benefit. You've got most companies that are disrupted. And then you've got people that are sort of seriously hurt and harmed. The response strategies vary depending on who you are. So, for example, I have a friend and he has several. Well, he previously had one. Now he has multiple face mask factories in China. So in that sort of situation, there's this huge spike in demand. And so you have to move quickly. You have to show strong leadership. Um, a lot of negotiations, you have to bring in temporary labor and staff and in order to be able to ramp up production and respond in that way. So that's happening has happened to quite a lot of a lot of businesses over there and then in the middle you've got the majority of companies for whom there is threats and opportunities um, so for example if you have got products that can be sold as having for example immunity boosting properties then it's a good time to push those products within so there's there's a milk producer Ely, and that they've had they have several products and they've pushed those hard and they've actually grown their sales throughout what's a, what's a difficult time. But it's not just about the product mix, it's also about how you communicate with the market. So marketing, for example, is um, a case I shared the other day about Hershey's. So normally around um, Valentine's Day every year, Hershey's will do these big in-store promotions, whereby for Valentine's Day, they'll have heart-shaped chocolates and encourage young people to buy their chocolates for each other. This year, they've had to not do that, and they've created these online sort of like give a gift to your friend, give a gift to your date type promotions um, in order to get people engaged with their marketing and therefore have the chocolates delivered online or, or by, by delivery. And so they've had to very quickly move their marketing. So if you're, if you're quick, if you're nimble in that sort of situation, be it through product mix, be it through how you communicate with the, with the market or, or make yourself noticeable, then there are opportunities to be found. Um, in particular, so if you can tailor anything to be virtual delivery of service, you know, or online delivery of, of product, those types of channels, if, if you're quick about transferring, then, then there's opportunity to be found. Now, for the businesses that are, you know, quite badly disrupted, then it really is just about whatever mitigation strategies in terms of renegotiations with staff and landlords and, and tax authorities and the, the kind of people that would otherwise be on your back for, for, for payments. And it's a, it's a lockdown strategy of whatever you can do to minimise costs to um, in order to get through this difficult time. OK. And what do you find over there that French companies are doing to either help with the response or to try and adapt to it? I think that is, from what I can tell, I'm not a business expert, but from what I can tell, that that pretty much is the same. You know, there are, there are most companies seem to have business continuity plans and are putting those into action. A lot of people have sent their workforces home and doing what they can remotely. Um I think one of the really interesting sectors of the working population uh, in all countries will be the gig workers, the people who don't, uh, in principle, have any benefits if they stop work or any income. And that's one example where uh, people are really going to have to show support and solidarity because we none of us want those people going to work sick delivering our food, driving our taxes and so on, that would be a threat to the health of the collective. Um, at the same time, we need to support them so that they feel able to stay at home if they think that they're, they're, they have been exposed and or, and or are symptomatic. So that means they have to be able to put food on the table. That means somebody has to provide some support for them in this period. And I've seen the dilemmas discussed around that too. Obviously, companies that employ those people who've been saying for a long time that they're not employees 
you know, in the legal sense, because that would come with all sorts of responsibilities towards those workers, are now trying to get that balance right where they can support them in this time of crisis, uh, but, uh, you know, not have to treat them in the sense of a full employee, which will, you know, have consequences after the pandemic has passed. How did they deal with the panic back in 1918? <laughs> Um, well, sometimes they didn't. I have a vignette in my book about what happened in Rio, where the government was compl taken completely by surprise, Rio being the capital of Brazil at that time. Um, and you had panic and, and near anarchy in the streets. Um, other places were better organized. New York City was probably the most advanced place in the world at the time in terms of public health. And they put in place measures which made a big difference, um, both to the smoothness of life, if you like, in the city during the pandemic, but also to the rates of sickness and death in the city. Um, so, um, yeah, it's it's I think the thing about a pandemic is we're seeing it again with this bug is that once it's out, we can do very little to get it in. I mean, we've had a beautiful de demonstration of that this time, despite the almost brutal lockdown in China and its author authoritarian methods, it still couldn't contain it in the global sense. It, it slowed it down massively and did the rest of us a favor in that way. And that made a big difference. But it couldn't stop it getting out into the world. We have a full blown p pandemic now. So let, let, let's let's go from let's go from self isolation to talk about lockdowns now, then, because obviously th th this is right. this is something that's starting to you know ha happen in in other countries, and you know a lot of people say it's only a matter of time before it happens in the UK. Uh, I mean, I guess I, I would probably like I would like to ask you the question to speculate how likely a uh, lockdown is going to be in the UK, but I also really want to understand the logic behind it in terms of how. How long do we lock down for? What are we trying to achieve? When do we know it's safe to unlock? You know. Well, it may have actually almost happened because in the UK to a degree, because Boris Johnson um, has made an announcement, all of which happened minutes before we started this conversation. Um, and he is now discouraging people from going to restaurants and that sort of thing. So we're in a semi-lockdown. The original pro plan in the UK advised by the scientists because we've got two very good chief medical officers and chief scientific officers was have a phased approach of doing this because if you put people in lockdown for too long they get very frustrated and it's not healthy for their men it's simply not good for their mental health so so you have to be very very careful about when you choose to put people in lockdown and how effective when you is. say phased are we talking about geographical phasing or um how how, how exactly does that work Fa phased over time um it looks like it's been accelerated in the uk than was originally planned but it would be over time so you would not be able to lock down an entire country for six months for example because the country you know a country could not function under those circumstances. And and, and, on, and on that point, I mean, how long do you think any country or any government could sustain a shutdown for? You know, insofar as you know, you know, we're two months. Let's say we're two months in in China. You know, it could could go on for longer. D does there become a point almost where governments have to say, you know what? <laughs> Fuck the spread of virus. <laughs> if, if if we if we keep this going much longer, then even though everyone's going to be fit and healthy, you know, we're, we're going to have no businesses, no economy, and we're going to be back in the dark ages. Yeah, and that's what all the debate is about at the moment, isn't it, Matt? In terms of this, is very difficult trade-off that we're all facing as families, as companies, as a society, and a country. Is there's people getting ill? potentially seriously ill and some of them dying versus our economic well-being. Now, for those of us that are leaders within the economy, it's it, it's hard to explain to people that aren't in those positions how that's a difficult trade-off to make. You know, when, you're, when you have a livelihood and, and many, many people relying on you and a whole supply chain relying on you, um, because at what price human life, you know? The thing is, Matt, that, that, that's, that's a debate that the politicians and society at large will be having. I think for each of us as individual business leaders, and we can have an opinion on, on where that lies, but that's not really where our focus should be. 
You know, it, it's a, right now is a time for us as business leaders to really step up and show leadership to whatever difficult decisions need to be made in the short term around, um, you know, planning with the team so that the, that the staff are well briefed, so that you've got contingency plans in place and all the kind of defensive things that you want to put in place. But most importantly, it's keeping on the front foot to say, right, how do we need to change our business model? It is a time to be reactive. I mean, what I do with businesses, I help them with their strategies and their planning. And normally you'd, you'd go deep, you'd, you'd analyze, you'd take time, you'd, you'd, you'd build a strategy. Now it's all about moving fast and being responsive and thinking, okay, there are threats facing us, but where are the opportunities within this? Where do our customers need us right now? What can we do for them that would be of value? And, and finding the opportunities and the positives in a difficult situation, because most companies, they fit into that middle category, right, of, of disrupted. We're all being disrupted and that's difficult. And so it's a time where we need to reassure people. We need to um, focus minds, sit people down and say, right, what, how are we going to respond to this? What strategy are we going to build? Um, because what, regardless of what happens at a greater level, this, is, this will be disrupting us for longer than I think people currently anticipate. Uh, I think the challenge that the country, the government will have with that is when people start dying in significant numbers, there might be so much pressure from media and from public to do whatever it takes, similar to a Chinese style lockdown in order to prevent people from dying. And that, that we may find that we do end up in a lockdown strategy, but that's all guessing. Um, and this the experience from China shows that this is something that could go on for significantly longer than people are, are currently anticipating. The general assumption at the moment, and this is based on the UK is running two or three weeks later than other countries with this. And we generally think the peak will be around um, May. Well, the so peak, peak of what? Peak. What, do, what do we mean by peak? The, the peak of peak, contagion? Peak, number, peak, peak amount of contagion, peak, peak, peak number of people who would have actually been infected. And we, should, we expect it to start going down again. In France, the doctors are telling me that that the modelers are telling them that the peak is about 50 days off, so seven weeks off. So it's going to get bad here and it's going to get bad in the UK just with a little delay. So in a way, I think what countries should be doing now is learning from each other. Uh, that are that are ahead on the curve. So you know there was an unhelpful period where people were saying, "What have the Italians done wrong? They've messed up." You know, it was such a disaster in that country. I don't think they did anything wrong at all. Um, I think that they uh, were just dealing with a crisis that nobody was prepared for. And this is going to come to France next, and then uh, I think it's already in Spain, and then it'll come to the UK. So businesses need to think in that way too. Yeah. A very important point, by the way is that this could actually be the first of more than one wave. And we've seen this with other viruses. So there could be a second wave of this virus later on. So there you have it. I hope you found that as interesting and as useful as I did. I have learned a lot more in the last 45 minutes than I've learned in the last 45 days of listening to my mates, the other so-called experts and social media. Uh, I know all I need to know now. I know what I think I am going to do within the businesses I'm involved in. And I really hope that you guys can go and uh, to, you know, make a, a tangible difference uh, to, to your corona thought process from what you've just watched. So thanks a lot for watching. Uh, if you've got any comments, if you've been affected by corona in any way, or you've got any advice uh, you know, for, for our audience, please comment below as always. And uh, make sure you subscribe if you're not already doing so.